Oh. Okay, now uh, I have uh, my son-in-law here. He, he's helping me with, with technology. Uh, the, the, the way that I construct the today's uh, meeting uh, uh, talk is, is on um, on maintenance, but as, as an introductory into maintenance and the importance of keeping uh, records on what you do um, and also how to de develop a maintenance plan. So uh, just about every, every, everything that you have that, that re requires maintenance, in particular like a car, uh, they have uh, shed schedules that, that, that might, with a car anyway, it might be every 10,000 kilometres you, you change your oil and every 20,000 kilometres you might rotate the tyres as well as change the oil. Well, it's exactly the same with a, uh, a ring of bells. There are things on, in a ring of bells that you need to do and, and check regularly but there's other things that, that the time uh, can be over a greater period. Um, I'll just show you the two, the two books. This will be back to front for you. Uh, the, the two books that are, are recommended for, 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 for maintenance, and uh, they're both uh, produced by the, the Central Council, and uh, they are really excellent, particularly uh, this one here. So in both of those, they, they have uh, plans and, 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 and show you uh, what needs to be done in certain periods. And I'll just show you that the two that are developed. Now these, these have got uh, lots of things that you won't, won't require in your own belt out. These come out of English books. And uh, as you know, English churches, you know, go back three or 400 years with, with bells in them. And, um, there are lots of things like, like uh, plane bearings, uh, uh, cannons, uh, casting crown stables, things that we don't have in most of our, 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 bell, our bells, and even wooden bell frames. Most of our bell frames, uh, as you know, are, are steel. So there, you could certainly start, when you start developing your own work plan, uh, just go through and, and things that refer to uh, uh, wooden bell frames, uh, you can just put a line through them because there'll be something, usually in your own church, it'd be very rarely that you'll actually come across one. And also some, some things, uh, particularly in English uh, books, um, they take uh, no consideration for different temperatures throughout the world. So in Australian bell, bell towers, we quite often have fans and air conditioning, whereas in uh, English, that uh, towers, uh, we just usually just plain heating is, is what they work on. Um, so I'll come back to that in, in a minute. So I have a, uh, a video presentation uh, on fault, uh, not fault finding, yes it is, fault finding errors uh, in, in a bell tower and uh, uh, the, the, title, the titles of each of these segments uh, really reflect what you find they're, 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 they're much aligned. So before uh, we start on, on the maintenance part, always with, with, with in, in bell towers, uh, you must consider safety. Uh, so um, who to notify? If you're going to work on a bell tower, you need to know, don't just do something uh, on your own bat. Uh, you need to let, certainly let, let somebody in the church uh, know that you, you, you're up in the tower and you need to have uh, plenty, of, plenty of signs um, in, in doorways, uh, particularly the door at the base of the tower. So when people come up, they don't touch anything. Uh, if you're right, right on the top floor, uh, probably the best thing you can do uh, if you can get uh, people to help you is uh, have two people. So don't go and work on a bell tower by yourself. Have, have a, another person there, particularly if, if uh, there's a chance that someone from the general public can actually come up the tower, uh, they can uh, uh, you know, uh, warn, warn the people off. And usually, if you're going to do work on the bell tower, you certain, like I said, you, you need to uh, let the, the church know you're going to work on it. 
um, because they could could have a funeral or a wedding or some other thing on uh, in the middle of it. Uh, always work with the bells down. Uh, some in some cases uh, pretty rare. Uh, you, you may not need to, uh, but but that depends on the situation. As long as you've got plenty of room to get away from the bell or to be on on the side of the bell. Um, it's not such a, a problem, but if you're in a confined space, always work uh, with the bell down. Uh, check the lighting, make certain that all the lights are, uh, are working up the tower before you go up there. Uh, keep clear uh, of, uh, and observing. If you're going to have a, uh, or try and have more than one bell ringing, it's pretty, pretty unusual that you can actually fit in a bell tower and have all of the bells ringing. There are some cases in big, big installations like St Mary's Cathedral you can, but quite often most of our towers are quite small and um, to ring all the bells it's just uh, would be very, very difficult. The only reason that you'd be ringing bells is uh, the whole lot of them or uh, ringing a bell at all would be if it's making a particular sound. That you, uh, or it, it was pinching in a certain way, sometimes the bell would drop. It could be the frame is moving and you'd want to uh, have the bells uh, uh, ring. A good, a good idea uh, now is to have a mobile phone. Always take a mobile phone up the tower with it, just in case. And uh, always keep in the tower itself. Uh, all, all you need is something like this, just an ordinary old exercise book, uh, which, can, which uh, is a diary that keeps all your... Uh, service records in and you can uh, once you've once you've worked out uh, what needs to be serviced and, and at what intervals this thing thing this thing uh, describes and tells you what uh, times you've got to actually do it the, the 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 period between servicing so once you've got that you can actually stick it in your diary and you know uh, what you're going to do uh, each time there are all emergencies when things break, for example, uh, when you wouldn't use that. But uh, but normally, things things that do a lot of uh, working, uh, a lot of uh, moving, like ropes. Ropes you need to check them at least once a month. Uh, so you wouldn't be doing it now with this virus around. But when it, when it's in normal circumstances, particularly where it goes through the gutter hole. Uh, going backwards and forwards, uh, it, it would wear out quite quite quickly. Uh, so, uh, and also, uh, what you need in a in a bell tower is a basic first aid kit. Uh, particularly if you're you're uh, going to be working on it, and you get, uh, one that you can move around, you could take it up uh, up, up the up the tower with you. Uh, okay. The, the present presentation uh, on uh, checking different components of a ring of bells out uh, was was produced by Ely uh, uh, Dyson Association uh, of Bell Ringers. Uh, I've just taken a part out of it where they actually concentrate on the things uh, it, with, with the, the movement of the bells. Uh, but if you wanted to download, I can give you the, uh, uh, the, the the address for it, and you can actually watch the whole thing, which goes for probably an hour and a half. And um, when it talks about how you can make the ringing room itself uh, breezy and and, and 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 nice and clean, uh, and and other parts of the tower, whereas I'm just concentrating on uh, the sort of things that can go wrong on, on bells. Uh, Okay, are you ready, Mr? Okay, so uh, just before we, we go, uh, is uh, uh, Richard, what sort of time do we have? Um, well, uh, up until eight, so you've got another 20 minutes. Um, but if, if it goes on a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, it doesn't matter so much. Okay, until eight o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Okay, right. So I'll, I might just cut this off as we go along. I can see the time coming up. Just for the last little part, we might, might just cut it off a bit earlier. Okay. 
So he's talking about ropes straight uh, first up. Everyone see that all right? Look for when we're doing our body uh, around the ring room is not to talk about ropes and ropes. Quite often we're looking for rotten wear, and especially where the rope isn't exposed to the atmosphere, like the garter hole. And sometimes I, I've had appalling luck with these little leather gaiters. I've had quite a few bells where they've rotted in the leather gaiter thing that you're supposed to put in the garter hole. Um, and similarly, I have a real aversion to people putting tape on ropes anywhere other than the, the end instead of whipping the end. I think it's okay to put a bit of tape on the end rather than whip it. But other than that, uh, tape can promote rot underneath it as well. Is that leather? We are lucky in the district. We do have an expert in ropes that we can go to, which is Phil. Uh, but what we're just looking for on these things is the, the tops. Very often, um, the, less, the less financially well endowed tap, there will be splices. We're looking for splices going through holes and splices getting caught in holes. And is that the best place for a splice? We look at the sallies. Sallies, when they're new, are about two inches. Um, you can, if you let your sallies get very, very small, it, it's very hard on people with poor grip and um, you know, people who have to wear gloves and stuff the grip, if you're going to offer them a one inch salary on a, on a heavy bell, that's uh, going to make life slightly unnecessarily difficult for them. And sometimes you see flooding um, shuff, fluff shedding, where the sallies are, are getting caught in the bosses and you've probably got a sharp edge or something up there that you need to go and pay attention. And for tail ends, um, the things I mostly look at is, are they absolutely gross and horrible and could do with cleaning up? And how good are the tucks and the tuck security? Uh, people, some people are more keen to have knots than others and knots and boxes. Um, I'm, I must admit, I'm not that, not that anti-knot if you just put it in for a while and take it out. But it, it is a much better if you can adjust the ropes and keep them approximately the the right height. And in my tower, we have the height of all the ropes or the height of the bottom of the sally or the right level I've got written up on board so that um, if we change a rope, we know what height to set it to and we can measure it and we can set it to that height rather than having to go up, down, up, down, shouting upstairs, which has never worked tremendously well for me. Uh, you can have two sorts of ropes, we all know, natural and synthetic, and uh, obviously people have a synthetic top and a natural bottom. Um, there's always a lot of debate on the Facebook who you go to for your ropes, and inevitably, whichever rope maker is mentioned, somebody will say they've had a stretchy set and somebody else will say they've used them for years and it's been wonderful. I've sort of formed the conclusion that um, it must be something to do with the batching where they get the original material from, in that the heat treatment is obviously a bit of an erratic process. And pretty much most of them have, have suffered from uh, stretchy ropes from time to time. We've had a couple in the district which uh, have been irremedial. And it doesn't seem to be much way around that. It's a, it's a bit of a lottery. Uh, and also, depending on how much money you've got as a tower, you've really got the option of buying new ropes, which some towers can do every now and again. And generally, they very kindly pass on their old ropes to less well endowed towers. Or you can treat them as three component parts and you can splice in new tops, uh, new sallies, or new bottoms as they get worn out. And uh, if you haven't got much money, I think it's well worth teaching yourself splicing. Splicing 
Splicing takes about 20 minutes. It's easily learnt off YouTube or watching pictures. And the secret is it doesn't have to be that good. Even a rubbish looking splice is well strong enough for what we're trying to do. Um, and you, know, you, might, you may worry that you can't taper the ends off nicely and get it even and the rest of it, but practically it doesn't really matter that much in terms of the, the uh, strength. So a few words about access. Now, here we have some, some ladders. Um, and if we look at these two, this one you think is quite nice. I suppose the first thing is, is the wood rotten. That's always worth inspecting from time to time. This one is quite nice in that when you get off up here, you step into the intermediate chamber fairly easily but it's really hampered by the fact there's no room at the bottom. And you can see a similar one here where this is quite a nice looking ladder, but how on earth you insert yourself in here? Um, I don't know. Uh, and this one's a more conventional sort of ladder. And there's two things about, about, I suppose, there's one thing about access in general, which is if you have poor access, people don't inspect the bells. It's a sort of trait of human nature. There's one particular tower that had for a while a very, very whippy ladder, an aluminium ladder, and people were not at all keen on going up there. And it was eventually solved by putting a bracing piece in, into the wall. Um, so make sure you can have a ladder that people go up. The, the other thing, and this applies also to access into the ring rooms itself, is make sure that there are handrails above the ladder so that people can do what you're supposed to do, which is you walk on your feet up the ladder until your feet are at the level with the floor and then you step off sideways. Rather than people, there's no handholds, they're facing the wall and they kind of do a bottom shuffle and a turn sideways and all the rest of it. That's the place where you're likely to get slips and stumbles. Whereas a couple of nice handrails through here where you can just go straight up step off, step sideways, job done. Um, we're not all ladders, of course. Quite often we have spiral staircases. And one of the tricks with spiral staircases is they are part of the quinquennial. Um, but architects have an awful lot to do. So if your stairs are worn, make sure it gets pointed out to the architect uh, and get them mended, because they're quite cheap to get mended. While we're going up there, we'll have a look at beams and we're really just looking to see if anything's rubbing against them uh, and whether they're going rotten or splitting. So that's the sort of thing we do on our travels. And then here's a, a couple of examples that sort of make a point. Now, there was a whole thread of argument about whether you pocket your beams or you um, uh, cement them in we won't particularly go into that but you can see this bottom one here is there's some wooden beams and there's some carpety matting stuff and it's all a bit damp and it's all a bit sort of rotten ish uh, this one is a nice metal beam that's let into the wall and is clean we can see what it's doing the secret with these things is to make sure that you have plenty of air around the beam and you prevent any kind of water access. If you can do that, this will carry on for probably the next 400 years. But if you let rubbish build up and you let damp build up, it's an invitation for the place to rot, particularly in the bit where it goes into the wall. So water will tend to run down walls, um, churches, roofs leaking and all that kind of problem and then you rot the end of your uh, your beam and then you are in quite a, a degree of sort of problem so one of the things we'll look at keep this all as clean tidy as much air circulation as you can possibly manage these um, metal beams they also will rust actually if you let the water come down the wall of them as well so <clears throat> the same thing applies to a degree to keep it as clean and tidy as you can. Um, this is one of the things we're looking for. So this is all a bit rotten and skanky. 
Um, unless you've got a lot of experience, it's quite hard to judge whether that's good or bad. This has got a wedge in it. Unfortunately, it's only got one wedge. It should have two going in opposing directions. Um, and this is, this is actually a bit of a frame. And this is showing you this white, uh, sorry, white yellow powder here, which is a sign that you've got active woodworm going on today. And, and then you need to get woodworm treatment infestation people in. If you've got a lot of rot in your beams, then you have to get a structural engineer in or somebody who's experienced in old beams to tell you how good it is. I can kind of do a rule of thumb. I see how much of the beam is left with, by poking it with a knife. And then if we've got lots left apart from the rotten bit, then I'll be feeling more cheerful than if it all falls out. That brings us up to the bell chamber. Now, the bell chamber, you save yourself an awful lot of trouble if you can achieve these things. If you can make it windproof, if you can make it birdproof, and if you can make it rainproof. So the first and always thing to check is very often they have netting to make sure that netting's there and it's not, it's not broken. Uh, if the church is willing to let you do that, then um, there's a product called Gale Breaker that can stop the rain flooding in. That's quite a useful product. But you have to do your best. The better you can keep the environment nice in here, then the better, uh, the easier the bells are to maintain. The better it's clean, because as I said before, the dirt and all the rest of it attracts moisture, which then leads to rot. Um, while we're up here, we'll inspect the sound control, if we've got it, and we'll inspect, we're looking for some form of lighting, um, hopefully in our, in our nice, clean, dry belter. And if you had a bird infestation, you're doing the cleaning up, that's when you need to wear the ventilator mask to avoid psittacosis. Uh, um, one of the things that people expect me to do that I don't generally do is observe the bells. Um, you see the bells swinging merrily here. Bells exert their sort of biggest forces on the frame um, when they're about Two thirds, three quarters of the way up. So actually, you only need to uh, to ring them up that far. Also, from a safety point of view, mechanical engineers, you never stand in line with things, or you, and most engines so on, you never stand at right angles either. But in this particular case, uh, I'll let you know I'm sheltering behind this beam and using my mobile phone. And this bell has the old problem every now and again and you can't really see it from the video at all. Uh, and what I normally do is I ask somebody if, if any of the bells doesn't go very well, and then I try and diagnose the problem before getting around to ringing the bells. So bad going is normally this set. The first thing to look at is some pulleys, and I'll show you a picture of a pulley later on, but they have an enormous effect on how well a bell goes. Things like splices catchy on things, catchy on the edge of things, and so on. The fixings is the bell actually secured to the headstock, and we'll talk about that in a, bit, in, in a moment, but you can easily put your foot on the bell and hang on the wheel and uh, see if there's any kind of movement. And there's another way of seeing movement we'll get to in a moment. The bearings, more a case of um, in plane bearing. Sometimes you do get a failed or a near failing of a plane bearing, but that's very, very rare. Rubbing things and hitting things. I'll show you a picture later on of rubbing headstocks or hitting stays or something like that. And finally, the one where you're most likely to have to actually ring the bell is frame movement. But even then, ringing one bell is isn't terribly informative because the frame movement might stem from some other bell that's actually causing um, a bell to go badly. So, for example, if, 
if one bell is hung at right angles to the other, the movement of the frame might pinch the bearing of that particular bell. And you won't be able to see that unless, of course, you ring all the bells, which can be quite, quite a tricky pastime. Um, Uh, well, that, that's about a quarter of the way through uh, of the things that I had uh, listed to, tonight. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask if there's any questions on, on uh, what you've seen so far. Uh, what I'm proposing to do is uh, I'll, I'll talk to Richard and uh, find out the, the uh, addresses of you all and I'll uh, send out how you get how you can actually see the whole whole of that video. And also, I'll include uh, these uh, charts uh, behind and the signs, and uh, uh, and give you the details. Most modern, uh, the newer Bell projects, uh, they get a box of books, and and that book, <coughs> that book is in the box uh, because it's, it's it's quite new. Uh, they're about twelve pound uh, to buy from the uh, a central council, uh, and it's it's certainly well worth it. This this one here is also an, another a, a good publication, and uh, it's it's a, a lot cheaper. But but the two of them together uh, will certainly get you on the right track to doing um, uh, preparing a maintenance schedule, so uh, you don't uh, forget any items. Okay, any we we're heading Thanks, on eight o'clock now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are there any questions for Ron? I think. A great time for anyone to ask if you have questions on, yeah, Ron, on maintenance. Uh, Ross, thank you very much. Could you also include uh, things we could look at when we start ringing? We haven't obviously rung for months. What sorts of things and what could we could we check on to make sure that things are okay? Could you send that out as well? Uh, well, things that could have rotted because it, it has been a fair bit of time. Uh, certainly the ropes are something that you'd go for. Any of the steel items I, I don't think uh, would require attention. Even the bearings. The bearings really go for a long time and require very little little maintenance. They certainly get over greased in their life uh, and also have the wrong uh, viscosity of grease goes into them, uh, which makes them go slower. Um, but you can send out you just said, can you send a, a checklist? Oh, this here? No, a checklist of what to do. What you've just been saying, things we can... Yeah. All right. Rather than wait... Okay, you want me to send it out? Yeah. Just send okay, it out. yes, I can do oh, that in the next couple of days. Yeah, wonderful. Sorry. Uh, Ross, I can tell you that um, at St Mary's Cathedral, we're planning a... Do well, I want to, I'm now the um, um, still people there as well. Um, we've, I'm trying to do annual maintenance days and I'm going to do one about a week before we start opening up ringing just to go and check thing. There's one thing that the UK found out um, when uh, they came back, check for wildlife because sometimes you can get birds or things like that nesting in up amongst the bells and the frames and things like that. So have a good look for that as well. And also, since we've been locked down during winter, check for water damage as well. It's just a couple of things to look out for. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. One other thing, which I'm glad they mentioned it in that video that Ron showed, I don't like standing in front of bells when they're moving like that. He was to the side, which is better. But, um, and I used to do it in my stupidity of my youth, um, but clappers can break. And by the time that you've, if you're standing in line of a bell as it's swinging in front of you and the clapper's broken, by the time you realize you need to duck, it's probably already gone through the back of your head. Don't do it. <laughs> um, one final thing. Uh, we have a, 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 a sort of an unofficial policy at St Mary's. If you're in the tower on your own, well, firstly, don't do it. But if you are there, text someone when you get in, text someone, the same person when you leave, and they know that you're safe. Otherwise, if, um, uh, if you, but I ideally have at least two people in the tower. Just in case something does go wrong, but if you just if you have to be there on the own, let someone else know when you arrive, when you leave, and everything. Everyone knows that everything's safe. Yes, that's for sure. Important to know if you going to tell someone when you're there, let them know when you're planning to leave. So that hmm. if, if you're planning to be there for three hours, and they get worried after two, then uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yes. 
Right. I don't, anyone else got any questions? Okay. Uh, for Ron? About maintenance? Nope. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ron. That was, that was great. Okay. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll, we'll call that an end for tonight. And um, so th thanks, th thanks, Ron, and thanks, Andrew. Uh, both great talks. And uh, uh, yeah. Thanks all for coming. Um, next week, I can't remember what the talks are, off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> I'll send out an email. Uh, same Zoom link as ever. So, don't forget that. Thanks. Good to see everyone. It is. Uh...